Hello, Mr. Nebrin. Even though I have made, I think, three refutations of the Kalam cosmological argument, they must not be too effective since, based on what I see of you, you still believe the Kalam is a strong argument that not only shows the universe began to exist, but also shows there is a God. In light of this, I want to try and refute the Kalam again because I feel at this point it can be refuted directly. In the past, me and perhaps others tackled the Kalam somewhat indirectly by taking it on via whether it is logically valid and other indirect problems. But in light of my research, I feel the Kalam can now be directly refuted. The first way the Kalam cosmological argument can be directly refuted, Mr. Nebrin, is if one believes in the B theory of time. The B theory of time directly refutes the second premise because on a B theory of time nothing ever begins to exist or comes into existence. The second way the Kalam can be directly refuted, Mr. Nebrin, is if one defines the universe as everything that exists. The totality of existence, or simply existence for short, cannot begin to exist as that would be a logical contradiction. So for example, the Kalam would be useless against an objectivist, since objectivism defines the universe as the total of that which exists, which means the universe, consistent with objectivism, is the totality of existence. This would again refute the second premise because the universe cannot begin to exist as that would entail a logical contradiction when defining the universe in that way. The third way the Kalam cosmological argument can be directly refuted is, in light of the research I have done, I feel the second premise can now be directly denied because the arguments for that second premise can be refuted. And this is what needs to be done to show that one of the premises fail, because the arguments that are supposed to prove that premise don't work or can be impugned. And if one of the premises fail, then the argument overall fails as it would no longer be sound. Now Mr. Nebrin, the first arguments that need to be refuted to show the second premise fails is the philosophical arguments for the universe's beginning. The first philosophical argument that is given is an argument based on the impossibility of an actual infinite. And the second philosophical argument that is given is an argument based on the impossibility of the formation of an actual infinite by a successive addition. Both of these arguments are intended to show that the universe cannot be temporally infinite in the past and so the universe is temporally finite and therefore it must have a beginning and of course whatever begins to exist has a cause. Both of these philosophical arguments fail Mr. Nebrin because they are both based on the erroneous assumption that all finite things or phenomena have a cause. This is not true since everything that exists is finite. Existence is by nature limitation. But entities or facts can be finite yet eternal if they have the property of necessary existence. The second reason both philosophical arguments fail is because they fallaciously presuppose an event-based view of causality, Mr. Nebrin. This is a fallacious presupposition because not everyone accepts an event-based view of causality. Objectivism, for example, holds to an entity-based view of causality. Objectivism maintains that causality is the law of identity applied to action, that all actions or effects are caused by entities acting in accordance with their nature. An event-based view of causality leads to paradoxes because it entails a linear chain of events that must terminate in a first cause to avoid infinite regress in its reversion. This paradox is not applicable to an entity-based view of causality since it does not involve a linear chain of retrogression. And you cannot have a first cause to an entity-based view of causality since as a whole one could only appeal to non-existence. An entity-based view of causality entails that causality is eternal since causality is an effect of things that exist. And since existence is eternal, causality would be as well, and you cannot have a first cause to that which is eternal. 
The third reason the philosophical arguments fail for the Kalam is that they fallaciously presuppose that time applies to the universe as a whole. This is a fallacious presupposition because on a relational view of time, for example as held by objectivism, time applies only within the universe when you have an external standard of temporal reference. But when you get to the universe as a whole, obviously no external standard of temporal reference is applicable. So showing that time is finite would not philosophically show the universe began to exist on a relational view of time. Because one will be trying to show the universe began to exist as a whole via something that only applies to its parts. To put that more compendiously, there is no clock outside the universe that will put the universe itself in time via that temporal referent. With the two philosophical arguments refuted, Mr. Nebrin, if we want to show the second premise fails, we must refute the scientific arguments for the second premise. If I'm not mistaken, Dr. William Lane Craig uses three scientific arguments that are supposed to show the universe began to exist. I think he still uses the Big Bang Theory, but I may be mistaken that he still employs that. If he does, that fails, since the Big Bang Theory does not show the universe began to exist. Since the Big Bang Theory is based on general relativity, which breaks down and becomes invalid at the quantum scale. He also uses the BVG Theorem. That fails, since the BVG Theorem does not show the universe began to exist. It only shows that inflationary models require physics other than inflation to describe the past boundary of the inflating region of space-time. You may protest, Mr. Nebrin, and say that the BVG theorem also shows that any universe at all which is in a state of cosmic expansion on average throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past but must have a past space-time boundary or beginning of its existence. This still fails to show the universe began to exist because one can appeal to asymptotically static models that at some point transitioned into an expansion. This also doesn't show the universe began to exist because the vacuum state of the universe does not entail a global expansion since it has no boundary or edge. And of course you cannot at all show the universe began to exist for those who hold that the universe is the totality of existence which is what it is on objectivist ground. And of course, use of the BVG theorem to show the universe began to exist is predicated on the erroneous assumption that if something is finite, it has a cause. This is not true for that which has the property of necessary existence. And when the universe is defined as everything that exists, it has the property of necessary existence, as it is impossible for existence in some to have a beginning since existence in some exists by the necessity of its own nature. And if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Nebrin, William Lane Craig uses a third scientific argument that the universe began to exist with the second law of thermodynamics. He reasons that if the universe was temporally infinite, it would have already reached a state of a sort of thermodynamic heat death. This would not show the universe began to exist unless one assumes that finitude necessarily entails a cause, which it does not. And the universe can exist eternally, eternally here simply means that it always existed, and not be in a state of heat death because new energy is created in the universe via virtual particles that come into and out of existence from the vacuum and therefore makes the universe be in a continuous state of fluctuating new energy. With all the arguments for the second premise that I know of refuted, we can directly deny the truth of the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument, and the argument fails as a consequence.